Welcome back. I know you've been anticipating this for quite a lot of time. Um, probably not actually. But yeah, today we're going to try to learn how the pairing algorithm works on LeechS. Try to learn how to do scala coding and piece it all together to make a more modular pairing algorithm that's functionally equivalent to the current pairing algorithm and the advantage of it being modular is that you could then consider the options of using other pairing algorithms fun stuff um, so uh, what would have been my last stream I prepared this CSS uh, just so Wikipedia, and that's the source here, you see Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia is the source of this uh, Blossom algorithm description. So we're going to read through this together and then read through the code and see what we can do to try to make the code not break but be more modular. All right, so the Blossom algorithm is an algorithm in graph theory for constructing maximum matchings on graphs. Uh, developed by Jack Edmonds in 1961 and published in 1965. Given a general graph, G, the algorithm finds a matching M such that each vertex in V is incident with at most one edge in M and uh, the cardinality of M is maximized. So, there exists finds a matching M that each vertex is incident with at most one edge and okay so basically there are never two um, M's or two edges there are never two edges E and M that are incident to the same vertex basically this is a pairing system so each point is paired with one other point or with no point. Um, and we're trying to maximize the cardinality of M, meaning that the most points are covered by uh, the subgraph M. The matching is constructed by iteratively improving an initial empty matching augmenting paths in the graph. Um, Okay, then matching is constructed. I guess matching is the word for subgraph here. Um, it's constructed by iteratively improving upon an initial empty matching um, and improving it along augmenting paths in the graph. So we're consi um, yeah, constantly, consistently, both adding edges um, to uh, this, uh, this match M or this matching M um, without having removed any edges is the point. Unlike bipartite matching, the new key idea is that an odd length cycle in the graph is contracted to a single vertex with the search continuing, continuing iteratively in the connected graph. Um, so bipartite matching basically would mean split the pool in two and then points from the one half are connected to points in the other half um, either randomly or non-randomly but anyway um, the new idea is that an odd length cycle in the graph or I guess what they're calling a blossom is connect contracted to a single vertex a major reason the blossom algorithm is important is that it gave the first proof that a maximum size matching could be found using polynomial amount of computation time. Uh, another reason is that it led to a linear programming polyhedral description of the matching polytope yielding an algorithm for min weight matching. As elaborated by Shriver, I assume that's how you pronounce that, um, Further significance of the result comes from the fact that this is the first polytope whose proof of integrality simply does not follow from total unimodularity, and its description was a breakthrough in polyhedral combinatorics. Um, okay, well, we'll... Sure, 
Yeah, that's over my head, this last sentence. Until that, I was kind of with you that um, being able to generate a matching in a polynomial time is useful. And since that is in polynomial time, it is possible to reduce this to a linear programming. Um, well, okay, you can always produce a linear programming approximation, but this is actually possible to optimize as a linear programming polyhedron. Um, that's all computer science and math and stuff. So we'll talk about augmenting paths. Given a graph, um, and giving a matching uh, of vertex is exposed if no edge of M is incident with the vertex V. A path is an alternating path if its edges are alternately not in M and in M, or in M and not in M. Um, you, this is just distracting. Pay no attention to that. <laughs> Uh, an augmenting path P is an alternating path that starts and ends with two uh, distinct exposed vertices. A matching augmentation along an augmenting path P is the operation of replacing M with a new matching M1, which is M operator P, which is M something P union with P something M. Um, hmm. Maybe the graph here will, or the diagram will help make sense of this. So we have exposed vertices at the ends here. And that if you like shuffle this up or down, um, you end up with three uh, edges there instead of two that are covered. Um, so, okay, and this is labeled augmenting path P. So this is a path that we're augmenting by adding a segment to the path. Um, edges in matching M, edges in matching M augmented along P. Okay, but a uh, problem here, of course, is that um, you're never removing edges. So you're never, from the matching, taking away a match that's already been matched. Um, I mean, you could pair the top point with the bottom point, I suppose. That would also be a strategy, but um, an augmenting path starts and ends at two distinct exposed vertices. Um, so we find some path through the graph that's alternating connected, not connected, connected, not connected, and then we augment it. Um, and this is all just these other lines are saying don't worry about other paths in the graph, they'll still remain as they are. It's only this uh, connecting path that's affected um, by alternating what is considered uh, connected versus not connected. All right, so by Burge's lemma, uh, maximum or matching M is maximal if there are no M augmenting path in G. So I guess this is saying like if you can't find any such path that can be augmented, you've maximized the matching. Um, it's an interesting statement. Either a max matching is maximum or it can be augmented. Starting from initial matching, we can compute a maximal matching um, by augmenting the current matching with augmenting paths as long as we can find them and then return whenever no augmenting paths are left. We formalize this algorithm as follows. That is, uh, I mean, really? This, this formalization does nothing to um, 
make the argument more convincing. Um, initially, I thought this was pretty cool, so that I bothered making a style sheet that um, had a specific style just for this. But now that I'm reading it, it's just um, while not done, do more. While not done, do more, and so forth. Um, where being done is um, the opposite of being non-empty. Being empty, you just return M. Anyway, it's saying just keep doing this kind of augmentation until you run out of things to augment. You still have to describe how augmenting paths can be efficiently found. Yes, yes, we are like, how many paragraphs into this? One, okay, so there's some history, there's some theory. We're one paragraph into the description, two paragraphs into the description. Paragraph three, we still need to describe a good strategy. I'm... I still think this could have been laid out a little bit better <clears throat> as to set expectations as to I mean this whole freaking paragraph could go and just say you don't even need the pseudocode this formalization is ridiculous um, blossoms and contractions okay Given G in a matching M of G, a blossom is a cycle in G consisting of 2K plus 1 edges. So this should just say an odd number of edges, of which, oh, exactly half of them belong to M. Um, 2K plus 1 edges, where K belong to M. One of the vertices... Um, so, such that there exists an alternating path of even length from V to exposed vertex. Oh, okay, so that's the key point here. Okay, so you remember this line where you're just able to augment this by toggling which, uh, which are connected to which vertex. You could toggle this back and forth all day if you keep adding points to the end on the vertex. Well, if you have a cycle, um, then if you have an exposed vertex, the um, point is that you can connect from the vertex, unconnect, or disconnect, connect, disconnect, and so forth. And uh, this cycle itself can be um, contracted. Um, so to find the vertex, Let's traverse the graph from an exposed or free vertex, we'll label it as the outer vertex. Um, if we end up with two adjacent vertices that have the same label or coloring or whatever you want to call it, then we have a cycle of odd length. I mean, yeah, so when you keep going or traversing the graph, traversing, traversing, you keep going around and around, and then you hit this point. And suddenly it has both colors, uh, or this point has the same color as that point. Um, you found a cycle of odd length. This odd length cycle uh, plus the stem here are considered a blossom. All right. Um, and then to augment this, um, you. Hmm. Case one, case two. Uh, okay. Uh, P prime passes through a segment and G. The segment is replaced with that and G where blossom vertices uh, so the new path is still alternating. So I guess the point is, as we're augmenting the path, we uh, take this blossom and insert it into the path, um, replacing a single point with two 
uh, I'm sorry, replacing this singular extension here, this single edge, with two edges. Except we're going to, um, during augmentation, remove that edge from the graph, or from the matching. I'm not so sure what's so significant here about case one versus case two. Um, I mean, this just these are equivalent, just whatever, in terms of um, which way we're rotating around the blossom. Um, if we have an endpoint, then the path segment. Those blossom vertices are this, are chosen to go from that. So again, we're just injecting this ring into the augmentation. Thus blossoms can be contracted and search performed in the contracted graphs. Um, not sure what the whole benefit of this is. Well, no, okay, I could see the benefits in terms of um, performance, but, uh, or in terms of running time or complexity. Um, also, what's this backwards dividing operator? Is that operator defined anywhere here? Um, MP union with PM. Um, m operator p is equal to, okay, well here's the path. I think this means m negate p union with p and negate m. Uh, so this is how we get that alternation in place. Um, the point is we could take these blossoms and inject them into the path um, so that's not necessary to while augmenting the entire path um, by injecting you don't need to redo all the rest of the path you just need to inject the blossom and you can augment on either end of the path and you can do this regardless which way the blossom is injected uh, clockwise or counterclockwise uh, if we have a blossom at the very end of the path, uh, we can just augment, uh, we can just connect it to the path without having to um, do anything special. Ditto for counterclockwise or clockwise. Uh, thus, blossoms can be contracted and search performed with a contracted graph. This reduction is the heart of Edmund's algorithm. So I, I think the key point here, I consider case one, case two to be the same thing, and case one to case two to be the same thing here. But the point is that you can inject a blossom into a path, or you can just add this blossom on the end of the path, and you've immediately uh, generated a much longer path. All right, so finding an augmenting path. The search for an augmenting path uses auxiliary data structure consisting of a forest whose individual trees could, uh, correspond to specific portions of the graph. In fact, the forest is the same that we used to find the maximum matching in BART bipartite graph without need for the shrinking blossoms. In each iteration, the uh, algorithm either finds an augmenting path, finds a blossom, and recurses onto the connecting connect, contracted graph, or concludes there are no augmenting paths. The auxiliary data structure is built by an incremental procedure discussed next. So you either find a path or find a blossom and recurses on the corresponding connected graph. Well, okay, this is gonna be a fun one to read. Um, construction procedure considers vertices and edges and incrementally updates F, the forest, as appropriate. V is a tree of the forest. We let root of V denote the root of, or if it's in a tree, 
what root of b denote the root of t um if both u and v are on the same tree in f we let distance denote the length of the unique path from u to v in that tree okay so input is a graph and a matching output is we're going to find an augmenting path or no path or empty path of rather empty path not no path if none is found okay so find an augmenting path f is an empty forest unmark all the vertices mark all the edges of the matching um for each exposed vertex or exposed yeah okay i think i understand what exposed means um do you create a singleton tree v and add the tree to the forest okay so we have suppose we have a pool of just a hundred uh, points now we have a forest that contains a hundred trees and our matching doesn't have anything in it while there's an unmarked vertex in f with distance um distance uh from v to root of v um while there is an unmarked vertex v in the forest distance from v to root of v uh huh unmarked vertex v See, this is confusing me. Already I'm confused. Because um, the distance operator... Uh, where do we define distance here? Distance uv denote the length of the unique path from u to v in tree. Um, hmm. Is this even in F? Um, yeah, I'm not sure what it means by distance. Because if these are all singleton trees, then there's no distance of which to speak. Maybe I do need to start with, oh man, maybe we'll just assume that matching is a non-empty matching. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not crazy here. You have to have to, you have to start with a matching that's non-empty. Um. You have to have something to see to this algorithm. Uh, otherwise, you just return an empty path. Uh, or, oh, I'm sorry, no, if it's not if the distance is there, but if you have an even distance. Okay, what confused me is it said distance, and then I forgot about even. As <laughs> I parsed this, um, like, do you even have a distance as opposed to distance is even? Uh, so I guess zero is even. So that's how if you have a singleton forest, um, then we do the following. While there exists an unmarked edge, um, V to W, if W is not in the forest, um, but okay, in our first instance, it is in the forest, so we're gonna skip that. 
we'll get back to if it actually is not in the forest meaning it's re it's claimed by some other tree but that's not what we're starting with if the distance uh, is odd do nothing okay so if you had a graph G that was a clean star a fully connected graph um, then distance would always be odd so we want to assume that um, G itself is not a clean star it's going to be something which has a odd distance between some point uh, V or some has an even distance I mean okay this is inconsistent with distance even do the following if distance here is odd do nothing else as opposed to if distance is even do the following <sighs> okay but yeah if your G if your graph G is fully connected then this doesn't work but if you have an even distance and the roots of the trees are different um, then report an augmenting path else contract a blossom okay uh, this is the interesting part yeah an augmenting path is pretty straightforward so if you had a graph that was just a straight line um, we have one exposed vertex on one end, one exposed vertex on the extreme opposite end, and a graph that is just a line that connects all the points in a total ordering. Then, yeah, your augmenting path would eventually just be um, just build an augmenting path like you normally would. Um, else, if we end up finding a odd length cycle, wait, no. If our roots are the same, we contract a blossom because the distance is even between a point and another point which have the same root. Two points have an even distance and the same root. How does this mean? Oh, okay, so this is a way of saying that we found an odd length cycle. Uh, Okay, well that's interesting. Yeah, you're right, in a singleton tree we wouldn't have any edges in F. Um, But yeah, if we find, um, oh, okay, so F is the, it's the matching that's being constructed um, by incremental updates. No, I'm sorry, F is the empty forest, uh, which gets populated as a singleton forest. And then we report an augmenting path in forest along edge that, or forest union edge. Um, so we found a way to connect two trees in the forest that have an even distance between them, or between their roots. Um, Else contract a blossom in G and look for the path in the contained graph. So the blossom is formed by E in the pedge in the edges. Um, yeah, this is the cycle that we were talking about. Um, contract G and M by blossom. Um, oh, okay. So yeah, what we're doing by contraction is saying we're going to add this cycle to the path, or we're going to add the cycle to the path this way. Same difference, um, 
in terms of geometry, but in terms of coding, you need to accommodate for both possibilities. And so this quickly adds, um, well, in few operations, this augments the path. Um, so we could track the blossom down here while uh, there exists an unmarked edge. So I think we skipped over this earlier. Um, supposing that W is actually in the forest. Um, so W is matched. So add E and W's matched edge to F. Oh, this is the trivial, um, right? Am I imagining this right? If we have a singleton graph, if there exists an unmarked, oh, an unmarked edge. Okay, so like this, if you're talking about singletons, then your entire um, F, your forest, um, this should probably say while well, R exists in, I'm not sure if it'd be F or G or M or whatever, but this unmarked edge is in some collection of edges, which I think we're talking about G, edges in G. Um, no, sorry, we're talking about M as the matching. So M would be the place where we check is uh, there are a unmarked edge. Um, all the edges would be unmarked initially. So then if W is not an F, um, mm -mm. so if we had a singleton graph, all the points would be an F. But if we didn't have a singleton graph, if somehow we have tons of singleton points plus an edge somewhere, and that edge would not be in the forest or so this point might not be in the forest because um, it does not exist in the exposed vertices. Um, so it is matched with um, something else, some other point P. So add the matched edge. Wait, let's add E. The edge to get from your current point to, oh sorry, the edge from your vertex V um, to W. We're going to add that to F. We're also going to add the matched edge to F. Um, X being the vertex that's matched to W. Oh, it's okay. I don't have to call it P. We could call it X. That's fine. Um, and then we add the edges VW and WX to the tree of V. Um, so this is a way of ensuring that matched edges do get added to the graph. Um, so that has nothing to do with identifying the augmenting path. It just is a way of... Um, adding the edges uh, to your tree. So yeah, there's two cases when you're taking a tree and combining it with another tree is either you end up with a, a tree that doesn't need any changes. Like say you were adding uh, this initial, there's a diagram up here, yeah. So you're adding this to this. Uh, say here's your root, uh, so I guess say here's your other root. You find this edge between the two. Um, actually that wouldn't even be how this algorithm works, but um, somehow you will find like an exposed vertex, you connect it to um, this connected edges. Uh, that doesn't work either. <laughs> um, so yeah, here's the concept of augmentation. This we're gonna 
uh, this one implementation of augmentation just alternates connected versus non-connected, which is not what this algorithm does. Oh, let me get that. One sec. So one possible implementation would just invert what is uh, connected versus non-connected. This implementation takes an exposed vertex and contracts the blossom on the end of it. Um, and Or it could contract in the middle so you don't need to alternate um, connected versus non-connected. You could just essentially take You've identified your augmenting path, now you're going to contract the blossom into the middle of it. So you don't need to toggle anything. Um, and the blossom's still accounted for. And what I'm curious about is um, as this graph continues to be explored, um, I don't know, like, what happens? Can something else contract through the same blossom? I'm not sure. Um, oh, wait a second. So if we find the blossom, we can actually take this blossom, snip it at these two points, and contract the other end of this onto, uh, I mean, you could even remove the whole blossom. Never mind. Keep things simple here. Um, but either way, you can like inject it onto uh, the exposed point. Hi, Ve. Um, so I think that's the point of identifying the blossoms: is that you can do things with the exposed vertices using the blossom. Um, so we identify an augmenting path which is all this algorithm wants to do here. Um, where... you have even distance between vertices. I'm oh, sorry, you have even distance between... Uh, between something. I'm not sure what. You either identify an augmenting path, or you contract a blossom and look for the path in the contracted graph. Um, so you contract a G and M by blossom, find the augmenting path therein, lift P prime to G, which I think means replace G with P prime, and return P as your augmenting path. This is a fancy way of saying recurse and return the result. The key step here, of course, is the contraction, which I think is described as we find this blossom and we contract it onto the edge, or onto the exposed vertex. Oh, we have an example. Why didn't you say so? Okay. Um, so the following four figures illustrate execution. Dash lines indicate edges that are currently not present in the forest. First, the algorithm processes an out-of-forest edge. Um, okay, so I was right. You do need to see this somehow. Uh, I think. I could be wrong. No, it processes an out-of-forest edge. You don't need to see this. Um, um, whatever. We assume there's some out of forest edge and we want to expand the current forest. Next we detect that there is a blossom here. We detect a cycle of uh, odd length and contract the graph somehow. How does this contraction work? Hmm. 
This is confusing. Okay, so contracting the graph means we're taking the blossom out of this um, entirely. There's nothing on the other end of the blossom. So unlike up here where we find a graph, we find this blossom, and we're not removing it from the path. We're talking something more about we found like a blossom on the edge, on the exposed vertex. Um, I mean, we have exposed vertices up here. Forest and out of forest edges, not in it. Um, out of forest vertices, out of forest edges. Um, geez. This is more complicated than what we need, isn't it? Because it considers that you have a tree which already is connected in this really interesting way. And when we're talking about a player or a pool of chess players, this is not what we're talking about. So I'm not sure that this is the best algorithm for a total ordering sort of thing. I don't know. Um, maybe it's useful, though, because uh, points are constantly being added to the total ordering. Um, What I don't understand is what we mean by contracting the blossom. So we found the cycle, but the cycle is like not connected to anything else. And why didn't we start by finding the cycle? Why do we have to add this edge and then we could find it? Um, but regardless, now that we found it, we're going to take this cycle, remove it from the graph, and instead this edge is going to connect there in place of where the blossom used to be at the end of the graph. Finally it becomes an, we locates an augmenting path. Um, so yeah, we've contracted the blossom out so that means we've got this potential. Oh, okay, so here we have an exposed vertex and an exposed vertex of the same color. And um, so by lifting the path Okay, so we take the blossom, having contracted it out, we now re-inject it in a different way. Um, so this edge that we were going to add doesn't actually get added. Instead, we end up with this blossom that gets injected in place of where we would have added the edge. Um, and by injecting the blossom, we don't need to do anything with this edge. That is so weird. But yeah, we identified W and X. Um, I don't know if W and X are connected or not. I assume they are. For sure, now they are. But we consider adding W and X to this i um, not sure why that's also labeled W. I mean, it's confusing and call this W. And then you have an edge from V to W. And now you've labeled this thing which you previously labeled as V. You're calling it W. I don't know about that. Um, analysis. Uh, the forest constructed by find augmenting path is an alternating forest. Um, tree is an alternating tree if it contains exactly one exposed vertex. Every vertex is an odd distance from a root has exactly two incident edges in T. And all paths from R to T have, or all paths from R to leaves in T have even lengths. Um, 
Oh, R being the tree root. I'll pass from that uh, to the leaves are of even length. Their odd edges are not an M, and their even edges are an M. Okay, I mean, yeah, that's a that's a pretty simple definition of an alternating tree. A forest is an alternating forest with respect to M, at possible matching, if its connected components are alternating trees, and every exposed vertex in G um, is a root of an alternating tree of F. Um, every exposed vertex is the root of an alternating tree. Okay, yeah, sure. Every iteration of the loop either adds to a tree or finds an augmenting path or finds a blossom. It's easy to see that the running time is um, big O of vertices to the fourth. Um, Makali and Vizirin show an algorithm that constructs maximum matching in B, big O of cardinality e times the square root of e. Um, okay. That's pretty special. Algorithm reduces to the standard algorithm for matching in bipartite graphs when G is bipartite. Sure, fine. As in, we'll never find a blossom because um, sure, so there are no odd cycles. Right. Weighted matching can be generalized. Um, by assigning weights to edges and asking for set M to produce a ma matching of maximum or minimum total weight uh, can be solved by a combinatorial algorithm. Uh, Kolmogorov produces an efficient C++ implementation. Okay, so that's the theory. That's all theory. That took longer than expected to read through. I'm still not sure I'm following the example. I mean, so we got this forest out here of, um, what's it called? With alternating trees in it. This, this is an alternating tree, this is an alternating tree, etc., etc. Um, all these exposed nodes could be different colors. Um, and when we contract the blossom out of here, we can find an augmenting path. And having found said augmenting path, um, now we can uh, connect the two trees along the path. And um, we still end up with an augmenting path. Um, and then what do we do from there? I'm not sure. I suppose we disconnect this edge. Well, no, this, this edge is still part of the tree over here. What was confusing me is that we had this nice, beautiful tree, which, okay, admittedly it had, it's not just a line, it's, it's got some branching going on. And we add another branch because that's what the algorithm does. We found the cycle. Um, Oh, but now we don't have a cycle in this rightmost tree because there's uh, we don't have like edge nodes down here. We don't have multiple leaves. I mean, we have the root of this tree. In theory, you could say that now this leftmost node is the root, 
and here we are we've got a a white colored um, node and a black colored node and so there's no more blossoms to be found here or I mean I, if this point here is connected to this point here maybe you do have a blossom I don't know but as we continue to add more edges to the graph we'll discover whether or not there are blossoms like at some point we'll find this blossom here as we're adding to the graph um, but yeah I would argue that this point here this path lifting has caused this to no longer be a root um, now we've this is our root this is now no longer a root it's now part of the tree or the alternating tree of root one um, but maybe there's a better implementation so there's an academic paper showing that there's an efficient way to implement this okay all this goes to show that um, we've got tournament pairing software um, where to go here's all our tournament stuff pairing system perhaps uh, is this is the thing I was being referred to earlier um, make preps, preps pairings, native pairings. Yeah, no, this doesn't answer the question of where um, prep matching. Oops, no, I want to locate matching. Okay, this is the thing I was looking for. Uh, this is port Joris van Rondwijk's Python code to Scala. Weighted maximum matching in general graphs. Taken from efficient algorithms for finding maximal matching in graphs. Uh, by Zvi Galil from ACM Computing Surveys, based on the Blossom method for finding connecting, for finding augmenting paths, and the Primal Dual method for finding and matching a maximum weight, both due to Jack Edmonds. Uh, some ideas for implementation of algorithms for maximum matching of non bipartite graphs. Um, by H. J. Kapow. Uh, <laughs> I assume this probably means Stanford as opposed to Stanford, but I don't know. A C program for maximum weight matching by Ed Rothberg was used extensively uh, to validate this new code. Um, but I assume by that it probably means the Python algorithm as opposed to the Scala implementation. So, yeah, that C program would probably actually be quite interesting if it could be coded to Scala and then made into a unit test. Jeez. Um, okay, so a matching. Apply just means this uh, gets applied when we, I would say construct, but we're talking about a functional language, so apply means that we're applying this um, WM matching to a collection of vertices and a pair score. Um, pair score being how much we want to pair the players together, I guess, based on whether they've played before or not, or based on some other function. Uh, define low level. Uh, with n vertex int. Graph equals full graph. Um, if we don't, if our graph is empty, low level is nil. 
else? Mate to edges. Okay. Um, we'll skip that for now and come back to it. Uh, okay, compute a maximum weighted matching in the general undirected weighted graph given by edges. If max cardinality is true, only maximum cardinality matches are considered as solutions. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. You have an algorithm that's capable of producing non-solutions? Well, I guess, yeah, this is, you could do this with either true or false, dependent on whether or not you need a maximal matching or an approximation, I guess. Um, which I, I assume that the approximation is probably of cardinality n minus 1 in the case where the maximal matching is of cardinality n. Um, edges sequence of tuples, describing an undirected edge. Uh, so most one edge between any two vertices, no vertex has an edge to itself. Vertices are identified by consecutive non-negative integers. Turn a list. Um, this function takes big O of n to the third. What? Okay, what's the point of having a max cardinality parameter to this function? If this is big O of n to the third either way, why would you take something that's not of max cardinality. Surely this... whatever. It's been demonstrated there's a possible running time of um, vertices times the square root of edges, or maybe it was edges times the square root of vertices, I don't remember. But end of the third is like uh, one and a half, it's like an order of magnitude worse. Uh, for large tournaments. I mean, at least they're honest and they documented this, but maybe this just benefits from readability, or I don't know. Maybe it benefits in terms of memory consumption. There must be many benefits other than the uh, running time, because the running time seems like shit. But I guess for small tournaments it doesn't matter. Um, I mean, okay, big O of end of the third is still better than end of the fourth. It's still better than other attempts, but it's not the best solution. And it, there's documentation showing that there better solutions are possible. Um, maybe they're just impractical, I don't know. Um, how big is this file? I'm not going to get through this today, am I? Yeah, we're at 11%, it says in the lower right of the corner. So if I scroll all the way to the bottom... Jeez. Um, yeah, no, we need a unit test, and I'm not going to try to modify this code. I need to attempt this from scratch and have a unit test. Good God. All right, so yeah, here, swap matched and unmatched edges over an alternating graph between two single vertices. But if we're swapping matched and unmatched edges, this doesn't consider that there's a pairing score between the, oh my God. Uh, we need a test. Um, yeah, the dual would be if we toggled all the edges on and off. Because there's a duality to the graph. Uh, here's the main loop. Continue until no further improvement is possible. Um, uh, 
I still don't understand the concept of like how we introduce pairing score. And then we're using a duality to do pairings, despite having a pairing score. You can't simultaneously um, optimize on pairing score and optimize on the duality of the graph. Unless there's some special property to how pairing score works. Um, yeah, where does pairing score come from? This is important. Because any rewritten version of this code would still need to satisfy whatever constraints uh, Lee Chess expects to be satisfied. Um, I don't think I'm going to see where pairing score is defined here. Uh, I mean, it's wonderful that there's comments here. But I can't help but wonder if this is more complicated than what we actually need. Okay, so can I find this rep matching? Um, okay, so there it is. Arena Antma matching. I'm not sure why Antma is a thing, but apparently it is. Okay, grab pair score. Um, okay, um, just play together is a edge weight. Oh, sorry, pair score between two ranked players. If they just play together, return none. Else, return. Um, Difference in rank times the rank factor plus the difference in rating. Good gravy. You've got to be kidding. <laughs> there was nothing about... Well, okay, there was something in the Wikipedia page about you could do a weighted um, graph. You could have a weighted matching. It could be generalized by assigning weights to edges of G, asking for a set M that produces a maximal total weight. Um, or minimal total weight. But. Uh, this falls apart very quickly, does it not? Where's the citation explaining this? Weighted matching can be solved by a combinatorical algorithm that uses the unweighted Edmonds algorithm as a subroutine. Oh, I remember the name Kolmogorov. That's for Kolmogorov complexity. That's a famous mathematician, but um, where he speaks of, well, you'll look it up in your own time. I can't explain it very well. That's it's a interesting measure of complexity. Um, use the unweighted Edmonds algorithm as a subroutine. Edmonds being the original, but isn't Edmonds algorithm O of n to the fourth, if I remember right? Well, okay, this is. Um, is explained in the 1986 book Matching Theory. But yeah, if I remember right, Edmonds' algorithm. Um, oh, sorry, here we are. Should be. Uh, probably should say citation number six, not number five. Because here's uh, Edmonds' non bipartite matching algorithm. Oh, there's even a link here. Um, yeah, I should visit that. But, um, uh, 
published in 1965. So Edmonds' algorithm, though, all right. Like it's easy to see that the running time is big O of vertices to the fourth. Um, Kali and Viziarni show an algorithm which is much, much better. Um, actually, huh, oh my goodness. Well, so the graph is supposed to be constructed of, um, nah, well, I guess we have edges. We've got like none as an edge versus um, a weighted score as an edge. Uh, but we don't have the formality of an actual edge object. Um, we just have a weight. I guess that suffices. Um, so, I don't know. Let's quickly peruse this PDF. Access restricted. Wonderful. Good to know. Might have to go in the Wayback Machine to get access to this uh, lecture. <laughs> uh, but this is from the Computer Science Department of Berkeley. Uh, some user KARP, or Richard Karp, um, had a directory uh, that contained this uh, PDF which is no longer available. Um, then we've got Kolmogorov. Um, okay, do you suppose that this algorithm is available? Describe a new implementation of the Edmonds algorithm for computing a perfect matching we refer to as Blossom 5 or Blossom V. A key feature is the combination of two ideas that were shown to be effective, the variable dual updates, and the use of priority queues. We achieve this by maintaining an auxiliary graph whose nodes correspond to alternating trees in the Edmonds algorithm, while use of priority queues does not improve the worst case complexity it, uh, it appears to lead to an efficient technique. And the majority of our tests outperformed various implementations, uh, sometimes by an order of magnitude. We also show that for large VLSI instances, it's beneficial to update duals by using a linear program, contrary to conjecture by Crook and Rowe. Um, okay. I only click that instead of going to Springer because I want the PDF right away. Um, how big is this? 15 pages. Um, so we grow the tree, we do augmentation, we shrink a tree and expand. Okay, so this is for sure going to be way more complex. It performs better, but it has complexity to it. And I would be afraid to try to implement this. Um, I'm actually confused. Did, was this a one man effort? He's the only resource cited on the paper. And that's cool and all that you're like the world's expert on building trees, but um, but uh, where's your code, man? <laughs> you, you keep saying this word "our," and then it's just you. And so I look for like pseudo code somewhere. Okay, acknowledgments. I thank Guado Schaefer and the support team for answering questions about their implementation and anonymous reviewers that helped to improve the presentation of this paper. Uh, 
Um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so I think that's probably out of scope. Um, in scope would be considering this pairing score. So none being a maximal cost. You, well, actually, what this should be instead of none, this should be like max int or max long or whatever the maximum number is. Some really freaking big number that says you know under extreme conditions where nobody else is in the tournament or something stupid like that, we could let them play again. But uh, that would just be my opinion. And maybe it's actually worth just waiting until another fifth player or pair of players become available. Um, yeah, the thing that also complicates this is you do have to regenerate the pairings um, from scratch. Um, each time that a player idles or unidles or joins or withdraws. So each time the set of players changes, you need to regenerate this. Um, so fine. Um, so else sum. Um, a dot rank minus b dot rank times rank factor. A rank factor would be some weighted graph thing. Um, whereas rank would be their just actual position in the tournament. I don't think that player rating should have anything to do with um, how good... I don't know. I think that it should be the least important factor in determining quality pairings. I think more important would be not the ranking of the players, but what's the score that the players have in the tournament, right? Um, yeah, this should be like uh, based on A's score and B's score and some kind of, well, okay, fine, you could have a rank factor in there if you want. Um, I guess I'll take a look at, um, what this is. What's the rank factor for equal to? Um, view, okay, we're going to go into arena view pairing system. Look for rank factor four. Uh, as a previous is static, 1,000. By increasing the factor for high-ranked players, we increase their pairing quality. The higher ranked, the more ranking is relevant. Um, this is, is between 2,000 and 300. Eh, fine. That's cool. Um, sure. Whatever. But I still think score is pretty important. Actually, you could... Well, no. I was going to say you could do a... You could make this rank factor dependent on what the player's score is. And that way if they have a higher score, um, that their pairing quality increases based on the score. Rank just seems so crude. Because rank changes as soon as the game finishes. You have to re-rank all the players. Um, should increase leader versus leader pairing chances. Wait, are we trying to do a minimal or a maximal weighted graph? Um... I assume it's going to be a maximal weighted graph because, you know, we're multiplying, well, no, it's the difference in ranks times the rank factor. You know, okay. Yeah, I, I think doing that multiplication by rank factor is ridiculous. 
If you want to do something rank based, fine. But multiply it by the score or something. I don't know. I just imagine that some player is like in 12th place with almost as many points as everybody else in the top 10. But because they have a low rank, they don't get a good pairing. If you have a really close contentious tournament, um, players at the top will get better pairings than pairings below them. Um, whereas I think if you have a strong result, you should still get a good pairing. And if you have weaker results, then you, don't, you aren't necessarily going to get as well. Uh, I guess that goes both ways, doesn't it? I have to think about this. And there's nothing in here about like being on a hot streak or something. Like if you just won a game, shouldn't you get a better pairing? I don't know. Um, I think that, yeah, if you, I mean, okay, so say you had somebody who was at the top of the tournament, they didn't just win a game, should they get a worse pairing? What goes into pairing quality? Right now it's just the ranking in the tournament. But I should look at what other models do and see if we can emulate that in some shape, way, or form. So yeah, that's where we leave it. I have not edited a single line of code, um, read a lot of theory, uh, gone through some algorithm stuff, but yeah, there's a lot more to be done. This pseudocode. It's pretty simple compared to the actual code that we were just glancing through. Um, I don't think an O to the 3 implementation is the best possible implementation, given that in theory, um, big O of edges times the square root of vertices is possible. I mean, big O of vertices cubed is fine, I guess, because you're not going to end up with more than a thousand points anyway. But there's got to be a better way, right? Anyway, um, yeah, thanks for stopping by. Hope this has been educational. I don't know that I'd consider this fun, but we're learning stuff. Um, I'll see what I can hack together to like test this somehow. If you guys happen to have resources, I'm not just looking for like ideas, but some more concrete like yes you can use this to help you test this sort of thing um let me know i'll probably go back to looking at this um kolmogorov well actually no that wasn't it that was there was um oh, what was the wm matching file mentions that this is a port of this code here I'll probably look at and see if I could find this Ed Rothberg um, maximum weight matching tester um, and at least use that as a basis for testing anything I might try to put together. My god, this is complicated stuff. Um, you know, since we're here, before we sign off, let's take a look at the uh, the other attempt here, the Ornicar pairing. This is probably a lot more straightforward, right? Okay, yeah. Um, see, I can understand this. Optimized for speed. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oops, that... Wait, how did this I make it? Okay. What the fuck? Oh, score is equal to... We're returning the value i, I guess. I was wondering what was this random i in the middle of nowhere. I must be the score. And we're attempting a maximum or minimum weighted graph. Um, yeah. I'll still see if I can find that Edmonds testing program. Edmonds, Edwards, what was it? Edmonton? <laughs> Ed Rothberg. So I'll see if I can find this Rothberg thing um, and somehow use it to test like this pairing system. Um, 
and somehow test it for large sets of data um, and see what I can do. Because I'm not convinced that Blossom is necessary. I'm sure it works, and I'm sure, as mentioned on Wikipedia, the most trusted of academic resources. Um, tongue in cheek there, but uh, so yeah. It says that it's possible to do a weighted matching. I'm not sure that this is a appropriate solution for weighted matching. And even if it works in a fully generic sense, and that's great, um, there this graph probably has special properties um, in terms of there are only certain values that you can get for weights. And so you can make big assumptions during coding that generally work most of the time and still operate fairly efficiently in all cases. So, yeah, we're learning stuff. I hope that was fun. Thanks for watching. Let's put some graph up here. Here we go. That's nice and colorful. Thanks for watching, and uh, hope to see you next time.